Hello, everybody, and welcome to Simon's Book Club, where we'll talk about some of the best books on neuroscience, relationships, mental health, mindfulness, well-being, and lots of good ideas to undo the unhelpful ones we've been raised to believe. Today, I'm going to explain how emotions are made by discussing the book, How Emotions Are Made, written by Lisa Feldman Barrett, who is a juggernaut in the world of neuroscience. In my first two videos on the book, I talked about some of the junk science and the mistaken ideas we have about the brain and emotion. And then I got into how we learn emotions. The basic idea is when we're babies, our parents interpret our situations and body language for us. And when they tell us that we're feeling angry, happy, or sad, they're teaching us these words and emotional concepts. We don't naturally have anger from birth or parts of our brain dedicated to anger. We learn how to attribute some sensations we have in our bodies to the word anger. Basically, it's our family of origins that, in a sense, set us up to be angry. Now, that's how we learn emotions when we're young, but that doesn't explain how we experience these emotions when we're older emotions are made and I don't just mean made up but also they're made up on the spot. We make our emotions every time we experience them as in we reconstruct the experiences of emotion. Now this might be a difficult idea to grasp so let's start with another important idea that can ease us in and that is the purpose of the brain. For starters the majority of what your brain does is unconscious you're completely unaware of it. In one of the neuroscience classes I took, I was told that the brain processes 11 million bits of information per second, and we're only conscious of about 40 of those pieces per second. 40 out of 11 million, and 40 is a generous number. I read elsewhere that we're conscious of only seven bits of information, plus or minus two. In other words, your brain wasn't built to think or for you to have conscious experiences that you're having right now. 99.9999999999% of what your brain does isn't thinking. So what does your brain do with the other 99.9999999%? Among other things, the brain's main purpose is to manage your body budget. Your brain allocates resources to your body. It's the network hub, the control center that commands the distribution of chemicals throughout your system, all unconsciously. You're not willing your heart to beat or for your hormones to secrete or your hair to grow. No, you certainly aren't. I wish. Your body budgeting regions play a vital role in keeping you alive. Each time your brain moves any part of your body, inside or out, it spends some of its energy resources, the stuff it uses to run your organs, your metabolism, and your immune system. You replenish your body's resources by eating, drinking, and sleeping, and you reduce your body's spending by relaxing with loved ones, even having sex. To manage all of this spending and replenishing, your brain must constantly predict your body's energy needs, like a budget for your body. Just as a company has a finance department that tracks deposits and withdrawals and moves money between accounts so its overall budget stays in balance, your brain has circuitry that is largely responsible for your body budget. That circuitry is within your interoceptive network. Your body budgeting regions make predictions to estimate the resources to keep you alive and flourishing, using past experience as a guide. Why is this relevant to emotion? Because every brain region that's claimed to be a home of emotion in humans is a body budgeting region within the interoceptive network. These regions, however, don't react in emotion. They don't react at all. They predict, intrinsically, to regulate your body budget. They issue predictions for sights, sounds, thoughts, memories, imagination, and yes, emotions. The idea of an emotional brain region is an illusion caused by the outdated belief in a reactive brain. Neuroscientists understand this today. But the message hasn't trickled down to many psychologists, psychiatrists, sociologists, economists, and others who study emotion. When you feel stressed out or your heart racing or butterflies in your stomach or anxiety gripping you, it's very often because your brain perceives something of importance like your secret crush walking by or your boss messaging you to come to her office or a driver cutting you off on the highway or your phone slipping out of your hands. Your brain is predicting something important about to happen, a need of yours that's about to be met or in risk of being thwarted. And so it's giving the order to your body to squirt out different hormones, the cortisol, adrenaline, blood sugar, serotonin, and the like to get you ready for the action it deems appropriate, all very quickly before you even frame the conscious thought of what's happening. Think of it like the feeling of your car revving up, vroom, vroom, revving your body into action. 
how does your brain determine when to deploy these different chemicals in your body? The same way it learned words, through statistical inferencing based on past experiences. So if you were taught by your parents, like in the example of Sophie from the previous video, that in situations when your goals are thwarted by someone blameworthy, you feel the word anger, then when you're an adult and you're in a situation in which your goals are thwarted by someone blameworthy, your brain will remember that lesson and it'll recreate not just what you did in those situations, as in not just your patterns of behavior and your reactions, your facial movements and your tone of voice, but also what your body felt like in those situations. It won't just recreate what you did externally, it'll also recreate what you felt internally. Essentially, when we feel an emotion, we are remembering or remembering, as in reconstructing previous situations, similar thoughts, similar beliefs, similar facial movements, similar tension in the muscles, and similar squirts of cortisol and adrenaline in similar parts of the body. If this sounds like mumbo jumbo, I'm sure you've heard of patterns before and how we need to break free from our old patterns. Now, these patterns aren't just patterns of behavior. The sensations you're feeling at those times, the flushing of your face or the racing of your pulse, the thoughts that emerge in those situations are all part of the pattern that is being recreated. Now, if you'll allow me some woo-woo here for a second, this is how I think of reincarnation. If we don't wake up from our patterns, we will reincarnate, as in we will be in the same carnation, the same body, the same patterns, the same chemical composition that we were in before. Now, this is where I think mindfulness and meditation are not just useful to us, but kind of really fucking important. We learned a lot of these emotions and patterns of behavior to get by early in life. Later on in life, therapy shows us that a lot of our older patterns aren't really serving us. They work to help us get by when we were younger, but we're different now and in entirely different situations and we're going to need to act differently. A lot of our patterns of behavior and frameworks of understanding and beliefs about others are actually getting in the way of our goals and values and causing us more harm than good. One of the things that I've learned in mindfulness and meditation is to tease apart these patterns of emotion. If I'm in a situation in which I'm feeling really emotional, I don't have to follow the pattern that I usually do and do the first thing that comes to mind. I could sit with it for a bit with patience and curiosity and see what I could learn from it. If you are at all into making videos or working with cameras, you might experience something similar when you watch a movie. Instead of getting lost in the story, I so often like take a step back and look at how the scene was lit, how they're pulling focus, how they're framing the shot, what soundtrack they're using. I don't get lost in the story. I could take a step back and notice how the story is constructed. And I try to do the same with the story that I'm telling myself when I experience an emotion. Okay, everyone, thank you. This session in Woo Woo is now over. But I want to end this video off with a story and a question that has been bothering me for a long time. When I was living in Japan, I was in a car with a couple of friends, Rachel and June. June was driving us to Nagoya Station and I was sitting in the front seat and Rachel was in the back. It was dark outside and there weren't many streetlights in this area. I was asking Rachel about anxiety because I heard her talk about it before in videos, but I didn't understand what it was and it wasn't something that I felt. I was curious about her experience. She told me that anxiety is similar to the feeling when you trip and you catch yourself from falling, except you feel it for a long time. I remembered what it was like to almost fall and what my body felt like in that situation. Now here's what's weird. From that day forward, I was aware when my body felt similar to how I feel when I'm trying to catch myself from falling and I noticed in what situations my body felt like that, which was primarily in situations I found very challenging, especially when I was around confrontational people. In other words, after learning about anxiety, I started to feel anxiety when I didn't feel it before. I started to be aware of my anxiety in challenging and confrontational situations and would even have anxiety attacks in which I'd feel frozen in the spot and I'd be shaking. 
I remember feeling one in public and not being able to hold my phone anymore and dropping it because my hands were shaking so much. That's not something I ever experienced before my talk with Rachel. And so, the question I had for a long time was, did I always have anxiety throughout my life and not just know it? Or did I just learn how to be anxious after this talk with Rachel? In which case, thank you so much, Rachel. Mm, you're the best. Thank you for that. What do you think? According to Lisa Feldman Barrett and the quote I mentioned in part two of the video, When a mind has an impoverished conceptual system for emotion, can it perceive emotion? From scientific experiments in our own lab, we know that the answer is generally no. And, as we know, there are cultures that don't have the same emotional concepts that I have. Now, I don't really remember what my experience in stressful situations was like before having learned about anxiety, but I also really wasn't self-aware or connected back then, but just running on automatic. I imagine that I just tried to distract myself in these situations of discomfort and avoided dealing with them through video games, alcohol, and other forms of disconnection. What I tell myself is that Maybe the benefit of me learning about anxiety was that it showed me that there was something I needed to fix in my behaviors and my situations. And without anxiety acting as a blaring alarm bell for me, I would never have taken the time to learn the skills to resolve the conflicts in a healthy way. Or at least that's what I'm telling myself so I don't blame Rachel for cursing me with anxiety. Again, thank you, Rachel. Now, that's all I'm gonna say for this video. If you found these ideas interesting, I'm going to dig into them a lot more in part four of the series over on my channel, Simon's Book Club. I'm gonna talk about how our body budgets directly impact our emotions and thoughts and come to a better understanding of how we're not as in control of our thoughts as we'd like to believe. Our body budgets have a huge impact on the emotions and the thoughts that we experience. And if you're liking these videos overall, I hope you are, I'll ask you to join my Patreon. I'll share the scripts of these videos well before they're filmed, in case you'd like to read them instead. And I upload these videos ad-free on Patreon as well, before I publish them on YouTube. So head on over to patreon.com slash Simon's Book Club, and let's keep digging into some great ideas together. So see you in part four. Mwah. Knowing how to tell one circumstantial emotion apart from some other dysregulation of your body is a challenge and we're not as good at it as we think.